Welcome to our podcast, which is part of the Global Change Management Compendium 2022. In this compendium, we will explore different thoughts and frameworks which can guide sustainable development towards a future inside of our planetary boundaries. Of crucial importance are the ideas of planetary health and the donut economy, operating as the overarching concepts behind our research. Now, let's dive into our next topic to find out how we can actively shape a future worth pursuing and living for. Hi, my name is Yuri and I want to talk to you about China's ecological civilization and the Green Belt and Road Initiative. While the donut economy is very clear about the ecological ceiling which we may not exceed and thus demands us to restrain from further development especially in the already developed countries, it also demands a social foundation for societies to exist in. To reach this basis of a secured life worth living and the entrance to a regenerative and distributive economy, many countries on this planet still have a long way to go, which demands development and, most importantly, guidance and help from the already developed ones. Our concept of developing which was mainly dependent upon exploitation of natural resources and pollution, as well as curtailment of natural environments, needs to be on trial. Of central importance to these investigations, therefore, must be the idea of decoupling of economic growth and environmental degradation. Western democracies are used to delivering answers to these questions, as they have been the main contributor and promoter of development strategies for the past centuries. Regarding the fact that these strategies are to a huge part responsible for the current misery which the world is facing, it does make sense to look for answers in other regions of the world, regions which will most probably play a very important role in the shaping of the future of our planet. One of these regions is undoubtedly China, though Chinese aspirations for more power in the global sphere and its increasing influence are observed with suspicion, if not fear, in the West. Leaving all political and cultural differences behind us, it does make sense to carefully and honestly examine the approaches for global development which are evolving in the Middle Kingdom to find out if there are lessons to be learned. One can say that the Chinese concept of development is still in the making, but a term which has been repeated for more than 10 years now is the concept of ecological civilization. And the most important project for Chinese development endeavors on a global scale is without doubt the Belt and Road Initiative, short BRI. In the following, I want to introduce both and try to identify risks and chances for global development. The term ecological civilization was first mentioned in the Soviet Union in 1987 and later adapted by Ye Tianji and Pan Yue, who transformed it into a kind of radical form of democratic eco-socialism. The concept seeks to reduce the damage which is being done to the environment while even ameliorating some of the damage which hath already been dealt. The narrative which the Chinese government is spreading depicts ecological civilization as the concluding stage of development after original, agricultural and industrial civilization preceded. The plan is to incorporate the concept of eco-civilization into the entire process of economic, political and social development, thus going even further than environmental protection. In 2018, the concept was even incorporated into the constitution and a new ministry of ecology and environment was created, which is attentively monitoring protection efforts in all provinces and has increased penalties and investment into enforcement. Another term which is often used in this context is authoritarian environmentalism or even eco-authoritarianism. As Kevin Lowe notes, the ability to quickly and effectively devise and implement policy interventions on a large scale is crucial, given the current climate crisis. The pressure on local governments to enforce environmental policies is increased, rectifying the earlier critique of passing environmental protection laws, which are neither enforced nor monitored. In addition, the government introduced so-called prohibited development zones, areas in which industrial and metropolitan development is restricted or forbidden, aiming to protect more than 25% of China's land. Politicians now bear the responsibility for the pollution in their province, which can basically ruin their careers, 
Before that, only economical growth was the figure which politicians were judged upon. Aaron Gare thus sums up ecological civilization as a set of solutions to technical problems that China has to deal with in providing water, food, housing and power to its people and dealing with the environmental damage caused by these efforts. Even though it claims to be a new and holistic approach for sustainable development, critics noted that few has been done and promised yet about the social and economic dimensions of eco-civilization. Extractive regions in China, for example, will suffer from systemic undervaluation of their natural resource assets in the future, which will punish the local population for a sin they never committed. Even though eco-civilization aims to encompass a systemic change towards environmentally friendly economic and human development, which does not rely exclusively on GDP, it still needs to prove that it outlines a beneficial future for the ecological, economical and social sphere likewise. So now let's jump to the Green Belt and Road Initiative. So the Belt and Road Initiative is arguably the largest development project of our times. It will influence 39% of global land area, 62% of the global population, 24% of household consumption and 31% of the global GDP. China's approach to international development and global cooperation was so far regarded with high suspicion. It will be even more significant and important to find out which form of transformation the BRI will bring. China did announce that it plans to foster green and sustainable development through the BRI, but many questions remain. New infrastructure will undoubtedly affect the environment and can threaten biodiversity on a large scale, if not built carefully and while attentively monitoring the impacted environment. The Chinese government therefore installed the International Coalition for Green Development on the Belt and Road in 2017 as a voluntary control mechanism of the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment and the United Nations Environment Program and developed an ecological and environmental cooperation plan to prevent making the same mistakes regarding sustainable development which were made in the past. Furthermore, it announced that its own environmental protection laws will be enforced and used in certain regions of the BRI, but opponents still condemn the efforts as inadequate and call for a more comprehensive environmental protection mechanism. Opponents also condemn the fact that the transparency level of the BRI is very low, as it is not comprehensible at all which projects are part of the BRI and which are not. Hence, impact assessments prove to be challenging. Regarding the energy sector, Research asserted that Chinese overseas foreign direct investment into energy projects became significantly greener since the green BRI was announced. This can be an important tool to prevent the spread of fossil fuel industries as a means of industrializing developing countries. Generally speaking, a green BRI poses a great opportunity for China to become a global leader, thus having enormous soft power potential. The environmental risks, if handled carefully, can also bear chance of environmental stewardship and the positive economic development and possible spillover effects can be expected to outweigh the negative consequences. Similar to the ecological civilization, the philosophy behind the BRI claims to be promoting the name of humanity as a whole aimed at the universal values of peace, openness, cooperation and inclusiveness. So far, though, these social aspects of sustainable development have not been considered as much, while for the environment and the energy sector, more comprehensive and structured approaches have been designed. A final aspect, which is worth regarding, is whether the idea of degrowth has been considered or mentioned so far in the discourse around China's ecological civilization. Economical growth has been a kind of superpower of China in the last decades, with more than 6% of annual GDP growth since 1991, except 2020, and remains an indispensable requirement for its political stability. So the question how and when this country can refrain from going further seems difficult, if not impossible, to answer at first glance. Due to the current crises facing the country, like environmental pollution, social inequality and an aging population, the government did acknowledge the need to change the path of development for China and depart from a single-minded pursuit of economic growth. Some bills were passed to fight the unequal distribution of wealth and other social issues, but still those inequalities remain massive. 
Jin Hye thus sees China at the crossroads of ecological modernization or eco-socialism, with ecological modernization having many parallels to so-called green growth, which relies on environmental-friendly technologies, an ecologized economy, and the state who provides incentives, standards, and regulations, while eco-socialism adapts ideas from the degrowth framework, calling for a production which is motivated by the satisfaction of social needs rather than driven by profit maximization. China claims to be a society of socialism with Chinese characteristics, so the degrowth-related eco-socialism development framework could seem suitable to the government, although right now the economical system in China tends rather towards the green growth-related ecological modernization alternative. Therefore, it will be most interesting to observe the future steps and decisions which China will take and to honestly examine the proposition which the Middle Kingdom has to add to the global development discourse. With the words of Xi Jinping, Civilization is inclusive and we must actively promote mutual exchanges between civilizations. Civilization and diversity and cultural differences do not necessarily lead to clash of civilizations. My inquiry into the ecological civilization and the Green Belt and Road Initiative in China attributes advanced ambitions for environmental protection and green energy projects, but coherent alternatives for social development are still missing. In terms of economical growth, China, as many other countries, faces the option of degrowth or green growth, both having their very distinct pros and cons. Thank you for listening to this episode. This podcast is part of a bigger contribution from our master's program. We would like to invite you to listen to the other episodes and have a look at our website to read upon more topics. Further information can be found in the show notes.